I'm François Legoff from the European Chemicals Agency. Uh, I'm the Euclid product manager, and I will um, uh, give an introduction to this uh, webinar today. So this is the, the part two of uh, our webinars for on Euclid 6 for advanced users. Uh, first, if you have some problem with the audio, if uh, your volume is too low or you cannot hear correctly, please verify uh, the volume on your computer. And if it doesn't work, verify the audio audio broadcast window uh, in WebEx. In case you don't hear correctly, you can always uh, click on the button Request Audio and use phone to enter your phone number. The system will call you and you will be able to follow uh, the webinar uh, with your phone. The agenda for today, uh, we will start uh, with uh, some introduction and then we will focus on the next service release of Euclid 6. We are planning a service release at the end of the month and to get with you we will go through the fixes and known issues um, for this uh, service release and we will also highlight some key new features like the replace during import, the inventory management, the comparison tool. After that we will have another presentation on some changes in reporting data in Euclid 6. Um, this uh, presentation was made based on the feedback we received from the help desk uh, and we wanted to clarify some points like how the dyna dynamic content validation of fields is working in Euclid 6 or how to report read across information. Uh, during, during the entire webinar you will be able to ask your questions using the Q&A panel so you can just send your questions to our panelists and my colleagues uh, will answer them. Um, at the end of the presentations, we will uh, leave five more minutes for you to send additional questions. And uh, we will end the webinar by answering some of uh, the most frequently asked questions. After the webinar, we will publish on the Euclid 6 website and on the AK YouTube channel the recording of the webinar. And you will be able to find also on the Euclid website and our documentation videos the recording together with the presentation and um, the questions and answers in a written document. If you have a look at the Euclid 6 website, now you can see the recording of the webinar we did on the 1st of June this year. Let's start with uh, the feedback, some feedback on the Euclid 6 release and the planned updates. So as you know, Euclid 6 was made available at the end of April. Uh, and for a rich submission, the format has switched to Euclid 6 on the 21st of June when Rich IT was updated. So since the 21st of June 2016, ECA is accepting Rich and CLP data only in the um, uh, Euclid 6 format. For BPR information, Marco, the screen, sorry. Thank you. For BPR information, uh, the change was done when Alpha BP3 was updated on the 5th of July 2016. So BPR dossiers have to be submitted in the Euclid 6 format since this date. On the 21st of June 2016, we have released um, uh, a first patch or maintenance release in order to address some bugs that were discovered uh, since the, um, the end of April. We have also added some, uh, made some improvements to the CSR and provided the final configuration of the dissemination preview for um, rich dossiers. The help system was also updated and we implemented a communication plugin in order to allow the exchange of data between Euclid 6 and KSAR 3, uh, which was released on the 21st of June as well. This release, uh, this maintenance release was made available with an updater so that if you had already Euclid 6 installed, you were able to use the, the updater to upgrade your installation to the latest version. For a first in installation of Euclid 6, there is still the installer that is made available. For each maintenance release or a service release that we plan, we will always publish release notes that are available on the download page on the Euclid 6 website so that you can have an overview of the changes, the fixes and improvements included in the release. A few words on the updater. This is a new tool 
that has been made available. And this, this is the tool that you will use to upgrade your UPIT6 installation. Um, how it works, you need to download it from the Euclid website and then uh, save it in your Euclid 6 installation folder in, in order to run it from there. During the update process, a backup is always taken before the update can take place. So this updater includes as well a backup and restore tool. That is uh, saving a copy of your database and your Euclid 6 installation as it was before the update. In case there is a problem during the upgrade process, you can always then come back to the pre previous version. The tool will guide you through the upgrade uh, process and you will have to specify your location uh, for the backup where you would like to save the backup of your Euclid 6 application. And you will have to specify the location of your Euclid 6 installation folder if it's not detected automatically. In terms of future updates, um, we are planning uh, starting next year to have two releases of Euclid 6, two service releases per year. But 2016 to 2017 is a transition period because we are planning already a service release at the end of September. It will be available on the website on the 30th of September this year. And <clears throat> the second update of Euclid 6 will be available on the 11th of January. After that, we will uh, start implementing our uh, new release plan and have two updates per year in April and in October. In only one of the service release, we will be able to make format updates. Uh, so this will be the, the October, uh, October release. But like in Euclid 5, uh, we will ensure backward compatibility. So that this means that all the data uh, previously available in Euclid 6 will be able to be managed in the new version of the application. Let's have a look now to the service release that we will publish on our website at the end of the month. It contains uh, this list of improvements and fixes. And in terms of bug fixes, you will see that on our Euclid 6 website, we have published in the FAQ, where you have the link on this slide, uh, a list of known issues that were communicated to us via the help desk by Euclid users. So in this service release at the end of September, we will provide fixes for these uh, known issues which uh, were, for example, triggering some side effects on the export or on the CRTOSI creation in Euclid 6. They were also preventing, in some cases, the generation of the printout, uh, of, of, uh, the, the print functions to, to work in Euclid 6, or the chemical safety report to be generated using the report generator. This service release contains also migration issues fixes. Uh, since the end of April, we have been aware of a few migration issues um, that were uh, identified for some specific fields. So how are we going to proce proceed with this um, uh, migration issues fix? We are going to provide you with a tool which is called the database patch tool. It's a new tool that will be provided to fix any issues in the Euclid 6 database directly. It can be run in scan or fixed mode. So you can perform a first scan to see if the tool ident identifies issues in your database. And if issues are identified, you can then run the tool in fixed mode. We recommend that you back up your database before running the tool as a precautionary measure. And you will see that the tool will contain a list of all the issues uh, for which a fix is provided. Some fixes will require a connection to a Euclid 5 database. So in case you have a copy of your Euclid 5 database, database that you use um, in order to migrate to Euclid 6, you can enter the connection details um, inside the database patch tool so that any elements that would be needed to be retrieved from the Euclid 5 database could be then migrated correctly to Euclid 6. But by listing also the, the issues, you, can, uh, you have a way to identify where the issues are detected and to fix the, er the errors manually. In the future, if other issues are detected, we will provide a new version of this tool. Uh, but the tool will always um, remember the changes that were already applied on your Euclid 6 instance, that, so that you can always run the tool and only the new fixes will be applied to your database. So in this release of the database patch tool, you can see here the list of fixes that we provide. 
we provide a fix for the cor some corrupted attachments that uh, were existing in Euclid 5 and were not fixed before the migration to Euclid 6. So with this tool, you will be able to fix uh, the corrupted attachments in your Euclid 6 database. Then we have identified some specific migration issues with BPR data, biocytes related data, and also um, migration issues for a specific um, document, which is developmental toxicity teratogenicity for the field dose and the concentrations. The tool provides also fixes for uh, incorrect migrations of inquiry documents in some cases. So we'll provide a full explanation on, uh, of the issues covered by this tool uh, with the release at the end of the month. In terms of improvements, we have implemented improvements to the user interface. We worked on a better contrast of uh, the, the text in the user interface, even when using some uh, customized Windows theme, for example. You will see that in this release, you will be able also to increase the font size in your uh, user preferences. And we have also addressed some um, uh, issues with the user interface for uh, the Mac or Linux users. Although we don't have yet a Mac installer, it's still possible in some cases to use this application uh, under Mac, Mac or Linux, and we are still working on the Mac installer that uh, should be made available soon. Uh, next point that is really important for Kaiser user, this new service release of Euclid will include an updated Kaiser plugin that allows the communication between Kaiser 3 and Euclid 6. In order to anticipate changes that will be uh, made to the new next version of Kaiser 3 to be made available in October, we have updated this plugin. This means that this plugin will not be uh, will make Euclid 6 not compatible with the current version of Kaiser 3. So our, our advice for Kaiser users is to wait for the next update of Kaiser 3 to be available before upgrading Euclid 6. In terms of new features, we have, uh, I can highlight here the dossier comparison, the inventory management tool, and the import replace option. And Mark, uh, my colleague here, will uh, guide you through these uh, new functionalities in the next part of this presentation. <coughs> For future updates after the September release, uh, we invite you to go uh, to have a look on the Euclid product page on the Euclid 6 website, where we maintain the list of um, uh, the scope for the next service releases. So we regularly update this page with the latest information we have um, in terms of uh, timing and content of these service releases. So thanks a lot. I will hand over now to Mark Roberts, my colleague who will uh, guide you to, through the new features, some new features of this service release one. Thank you very much, Mark. Hello, uh, my name is Mark Roberts. I'm going to be guiding you today through three new uh, features in the next service release of Euclid. So the first one, uh, replace during import. This is a true replace offering you a complete overwrite of the data set with the same UUID. The purpose of this uh, new feature is that it will allow you to replace an existing data set, a template, substance, or mixture product, with an archive version of that data set um, based on the same UUID. Uh, this is done using the import functionality of Euclid. So a brief overview of how uh, this works. Uh, the replace feature is located inside the import functionality of Euclid. Uh, when you replace an existing data set, with an imported data set uh, identified by the same UUID. The existing data set will then exactly reflect the newly imported data set. Um, and it's important to remember that this includes its links to other documents and entities. And thirdly, when importing a replacement template, all substance or mixture product data sets using this template as an inherited template will also be updated with the newly imported template. Um, a warning for you, because this is something that happens only with the replace feature um, and not always or other default actions in the import functionality. Uh, when you replace a data set, all documents which are in the existing data set but not in the imported data set will be deleted. 
So as a consequence of this, uh, any link in the remaining data set, import, which reference the now deleted document will be removed. For example, if a composition record uh, is referenced in section 2.1 GHS and the imported data set deletes this reference composition record, the reference in 2.1 will also be removed. So moving on to how to use the replace feature, um, you open the import functionality via the UFID uh, homepage by clicking on import. You must have um, read, write, and delete access to all sections and entities. And then you make sure that you've selected replace as the default action. You then add your uh, data set you wish to, repl you wish to uh, replace. Uh, to, you wish uh, as the data sets you want to replace other data sets with. Uh, make sure that you have indeed selected the replace default action and you click finish. Um, as a small is illustrative example now of how this works, um, if I had created a data set in Euclid with two records in section 4.1, we call this data set 1 for instance, I now export this data set to make it an archive data set. I then uh, add a new record to 4.1, and then I re-import data set 1. The third data set that I had added um, will be removed. Um, this is uh, important because it shows a difference between the replace and the always function, the import functionality. When I use replace, the uh, third uh, additional record will be removed. If I was using always, it would be kept. So moving on to the inventory management feature of Euclid. Um, the purpose of this is to help users better manage their inventory entities. This includes the test material information, the legal entity, legal entity site, the reference substance, contact, and literature reference. Note that this does not include your chemical inventories. So a brief overview of how this one works. Um, a user can replace one or more existing entities with a single inventory entity of the same type. When a user replaces uh, an entity, that entity will be replaced in every data set, data set where it is used. So a substance, a mixture product, a template, a category. Note that the entities in the dossier are not, are not affected as these are read only. Um, also note that um, three entities, contact, reference substance, and legal entity, are used in other entities and will also be replaced. So for instance, if I replace a contact, that will also be replaced in legal entity if it's linked there. Any entity which is uh, replaced is deleted from the Euclid database. And so as Francois mentioned earlier, it's recommended that you use the uh, backup restore feature or tool of Euclid to make sure that you've saved any data that could go missing. So again, as a small uh, illustrative example of how the um, inventory management works, um, if I have uh, two legal entities in, in Euclid, legal entity one and legal entity two, which are linked in various places in Euclid, for instance, substance section 1.5 or substance section 1.8, and I want to replace these two with a single inventory entity, legal entity three in this example here, um, then once the replace is done, you will see that the legal entity three occurs in all those different areas where legal entity one and legal entity two were originally assigned. Um, note that when the action is complete, um, legal entity one and legal entity two are removed from the list of legal entities. So moving on to how the inventory management um, feature actually works. Um, in the next service release of Euclid, you will be able to right click on an entity and from there you can select the inventory management tool itself or you can simply go to the admin in the Euclid address bar and select it from there. So when you select inventory management, the first stage will be the screen you see in front of you here um, where you can select the entity or entities you wish to replace um, and you do this by clicking add. Just to note, you can cancel the step at any time by pressing cancel. So once you um, press add to select the entity or entities you wish to replace, um, you first of all search for a result type, which will then define which entity you actually want to replace. 
and then you can further refine uh, this by going to the query type. Here you can get all the entities you're looking for. You can find a specific entity using key information about that entity. Note here you can also use, for instance, the wildcard asterisk um, to help you search, or you can search through the uh, creation modification date of the entity. And these are just some screenshots of how that would look. It's important to note that you can replace more than one entity at a time. Um, indeed, this is one of the central uses of this feature. So you can select more than one here, as in the screenshot. So once you've selected your entities, they will appear in a list in the first step of the wizard. Uh, note that there's several actions you can do now. You can add more entities. You can remove any entities you so wish. Um, and also, you can actually open the entity itself in the background screen of Euclid by clicking Open Document. Um, you can also see the various links these entities are, are linked to in the various places in Euclid by clicking uh, Show Links. Um, this is an, an important functionality because here you can see all the different Euclid relationships of that entity. And so it's quite useful for checking to make sure that you do indeed want to replace that entity. And so you click next once you're happy with your list of entities. And then you go to the next step of the wizard where you select the single inventory you wish to replace the previous list with. Again, you have the familiar query type uh, search model where you can search for all the different entities. You can find a specific entity uh, using uh, data particular to that entity, or you can search by the creation modification date. Um, once you're happy with the inventory entity you have um, decided to replace the previous entities with, you click Assign and Next on the uh, wizard. And then you will see a nice summary listing all the entities that will be replaced and the entity that will replace them. Um, as in the first step of the wizard, you'll be able to open uh, the entities directly by clicking Open Document and also you'll be able to see uh, the links of those entities you're going to be replacing. Again, this is just to make sure that you are indeed replacing the entities you wish to replace. Um, you can also open the entity you will be replacing them with um, itself by clicking on the little arrow there on the side. So once you finish that, the uh, action is complete and you'll get a brief summary of the replaced entities and the entity that has been replaced. You then click on export report if you wish to export a um, Excel of this summary and save it locally on your machine. And thirdly, I'm moving on to the comparison tool. So the purpose of the comparison tool um, is that it's been updated and improved in Euclid 6 to help you compare whether the same documents exist in two different dossiers and also to compare the content of those documents thereby allowing you to see in much greater detail the similarities and differences between two dossiers. So an overview of uh, how this works, two dossiers are compared and are considered identical when all documents within them have the same content of information. When the dossiers are found to have the same UUIDs and different content, the comparison tool clearly highlights these for you so you can easily identify where the similarities and differences are to be found. So you um, start the comparison tool by going to uh, your list of dossiers in Euclid. You then select one or two dossiers and right click and then click compare. In the first step of the wizard, this will allow you to choose a new or a different dossier to compare by clicking on the little link icon there. You can also select which dossier is to be considered the first or the second dossier in the comparison. That will become more apparent later on in the next step. Uh, the reason for that and uh, you can display a selected dossier in the data window of Euclid by clicking on the arrow button and you can finally also remove uh, a currently selected dossier. So once you've uh, selected your dossiers you move on to the next step of the wizard. Here you have two panels, a left and a right panel. On the left panel which you see here on the top is the dossier header comparison. This will only show one dossier if the two dossiers you're comparing have the same submission type. 
and you can view then the different you can view then the differences between those dossiers by clicking on the view differences button highlighted there for you. Um, when you view when you view the differences, um, it'll be clearly indicated to you uh, what's identical and uh, what's different. Uh, in red will be the difference and in green will be the identical. You can use the filter uh, which is shown there for you to only see either the, the difference uh, the different or the identical. And so moving on to the right hand side panel, if you select um, from the left hand side panel um, anything that has a data set attached to it, this will then appear in the right hand side panel. So here I've uh, selected a substance that's common to both dossiers and you will see the tree structure on the right there. Um, when you uh, view uh, a um, record that has differences you can again view differences of that particular record and you'll be able to see uh, the differences and what's identical. So here in the example I have a hazard pictogram code which is only in dossier 1 and not in dossier 2 and it's a uh, has a number one next to it as you can see there. Number one refers to the fact that this is the first dossier you selected in the first step of the wizard. Um, and as you can see in the example there's a precautionary statement uh, which is in both dossiers but has different content. This is referenced by the icon which shows that it has the same, the document has the same UUID but it has different content. And just to make uh, clear to you there's a reference key at the bottom of the wizard um, which will help you to navigate and understand what the comparison results are. So it's helpful that you familiarize yourself with this uh, before looking uh, in greater depth at the results of the comparison. And I think that's all. Yes, I will hand over to my colleague Anika to uh, carry on the presentation. Good morning everybody, my name is Anika Malkia and I'm going to talk about some of the changes in data reporting between Euclid 6 and Euclid 5. And as Francois already mentioned, <coughs> we've picked these uh, topics uh, from some help desk questions we received. Uh, and we'll be looking at mainly three topics, uh, dynamic content validations with examples from sections 2.1, um, administrative data and endpoint study records, and use and exposure information in section 3.5. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, then we'll also be looking at reporting of read across information in Euclid 6 and the impact of the amendment of the reach annexes in regards to skin and eye irritation information requirements and skin sensitization. <coughs> so starting with the dynamic content validation. What are we talking about when we refer to dynamic content validation? This means that when the user makes a selection in a field that is subject to dynamic content validation, this causes incompatible fields to become inactive. And why has this been introduced? It's been introduced to support the user in not entering conflicting information in the application, which would then not be understood by the reader. How does this work? Um, as I already said, when the user makes a selection in a field, uh, which is subject to dynamic content validation, then the incompatible fields become inactive. If a document was migrated from Euclid 5 and already had uh, incompatible information entered because there was hardly ad any dynamic content validation in Euclid 5, then the conflicting content will be shown uh, highlighted in orange. <coughs> and if the user tries to save this document because they uh, introduced some changes in it, an information message is displayed as in the screenshot that you can see on the slide. And the conflicting information must be corrected before saving is allowed. And this can either be done by letting the application do automatically this correction or you can cancel the save action and go back and uh, correct the conflict so that these orange fields disappear. <coughs> and some examples of where dynamic content validation takes place. Uh, first of all, we have section 2.1 on the GHS. And here the field reason for no classification will be uh, inactive if any of the fields hazard category or hazard statement are filled in or vice versa and you see a screenshot of how this works. And this feature was actually already in place in Euclid 5, so as such it's not a new feature, but since we had some questions on this, it's good to keep in mind that this is the way the dynamic content validation works. You cannot fill in both, or you cannot have fields active, both for classification information and the reason for no classification. 
<coughs> and then let's follow with the endpoint study records and the administrative data part. So when a new endpoint study record is created and the user indicates that this record is for reporting information from a study, then the fields that are relevant for reporting uh, data waving information and justifications are unavailable and vice versa. And this you can see also in the screenshot where the below two fields for reporting data waving uh, become uh, inactive. <coughs> now, if this endpoint study record would have been created in Euclid 5, it is possible that the user could have entered inconsistent or incompatible information and filled in fields both for study information and data waving. In this case, when this uh, document or this other substance data set containing this document is imported or migrated to Euclid 6, the incompatible fields will be highlighted in orange, as I said previously. And this conflict needs to be corrected before the user can proceed and save the document. <coughs> A third area where we introduce dynamic content validation is in section 3.5, use and exposure information. So at the top of e each uh, use and exposure record in section 3.5, there's a field called registration notification status for the use. And the selection in this field conditions the availability of the fields, uh, the remaining fields in this use record. So for example, uh, I have here a document from section 3.5.3, uses at industrial sites. And if I would say that this use or indicate that this use is for an article 10 registration with a tonnage above 10 tons per registrant, this would mean <coughs> that all the fields for reporting information on intermediates become inactive because I have selected a uh, use which is not an intermediate uh, use. On the other hand, if I would make the selection and indicate that this use is registered according, according to reach article 17 or 18, uh, then this would mean that the tabs for reporting contributing scenarios for workers and the environment become inactive because it's not expected um, that uses for strictly controlled intermediates would contain exposure scenario information. And of course, the fields for reporting information on intermediates will be active in this case. And that was the dynamic con content validation. Then moving on to the second topic, which is read across information. First, a little bit of background information <coughs> on why we've changed the reporting of read across. In Euclid 5, read across information uh, was reported differently depending on whether the, use, whether the registrant used a grouping or a category approach or whether they used an analog approach. So there was a different structure of the information depending on which case applied. And on the other hand, read across is one of the main areas where the quali quality of the information provided has been a concern. So as a consequ consequence of this, we have decided to at least try to streamline the reporting approach to support that the information is clear in the registration dossier. Now, what are the two fundamental changes in Euclid 6? First of all, in Euclid 6, read across is always reported as a source target structure. So it always needs the source and target information separately. <coughs> and another important change is that the endpoint specific read across justification must be provided inside the target record. And then looking at uh, in more detail for the two different approaches, how read across information is to be reported in Euclid 6. So starting with the category approach, first of all, the source information is the experimental information or experimental data on the group of substances, meaning the category. And this information is to, be, is to be provided in the category member substance data sets. Then we have the target information on the other hand, which is the outcome of applying read across on this category. <coughs> and this is provided as an endpoint study record in the substance data set of the registered substance with the type of information set to read across based on grouping of substances. This approach is basically the same as it was in Euclid 5. The only difference is that uh, the target record information that needs to be provided in the registered substance data set is limited compared to a normal endpoint study record. So it only needs to contain fields uh, that reflect the read across exercise, uh, it not fields related to the experimental setup, such as uh, the guideline or <coughs> materials and methods or reliability of the data, because this is expected to be available already with the source data, which are the experimental data. Uh, then the analog supporting substance approach. Here there is a bigger change in Euclid 6 because source and target information 
are to be provided in the substance dataset of the registered substance in separate records, not together as often took place in the past. <coughs> the source data are to be reported as a normal experimental study record filled in according to the instructions for a robust study summary, which can be found in the manuals on the ECHO website. And it's important here, of course, that the test material identifies the substance on which the experimental study or test was done. Then we have the target data. These are to be reported as a separate endpoint study record with the type of information field set to read across from supporting substance, structural analog or surrogate. And the information provided here is again limited in comparison to the normal endpoint study records because only fields that reflect the read across exercise are need to be filled in and not uh, fields related to the experimental setup, which are again available in the source data. And here is a table of comparison of what is the expected content in the source and target records of an, an analog approach in Euclid 6. So you see in red crosses is the, are the sections or chapters or, or fields that are mandatory for the completeness check. And in uh, black crosses or X's, you can see information is optional, but is, it can be relevant for the, for the documentation. So here you see the main differences uh, lie in uh, that the reliability and rationale for reliability, uh, this type of information is not uh, needed in the target record because this is uh, experimental study related information and not related to the read across exercise. Data waving fields are of course empty in both cases. And then when we come to the bottom of the administrative data section, we have the justification for type of information uh, and the cross reference. And these fields must be filled in in the target record while they are not relevant for the source record. Again, looking at more differences, data source and materials and methods must be provided in the source record but since these are experimental details, they are not relevant for the target record. Both for target and source, test materials and results and discussion must be provided and as applicable or relevant, the over overall remarks and the applicant summary and conclusion. <coughs> now, the main questions we, re uh, we received through the help desk are actually related to the migration of information or they are submitted by users who were used to reporting read across information in Euclid 5 and are now adapting their approach to Euclid 6. Uh, first of all, it's important to note um, that we realized uh, when we changed the approach that th there are quite many um, um, documents already reported where read across has been applied <coughs> in the past. Uh, so there's quite a large uh, impact of making this change. Um, and therefore, when we did the migration from Euclid 5 to Euclid 6, we added the tag migrated information to the type of information fields, uh, as you can see in the screenshot. Uh, and this means uh, that we are able to detect which of these documents have been migrated, and we will apply a completeness check as for a normal endpoint study record on these documents, and will not, for example, require the source and target splitting in when it comes to the analog approach. However, it's strongly recommended for, for the benefit of clarity and data quality to move to the new approach whenever uh, possible. <coughs> and then when moving to the new approach, here's a, a short checklist uh, of what to do. When using the category uh, approach, uh, what needs to be uh, verified is that the category object exists in the dossier because this has not always been the case in the past. And it contains the full documentation of the category definition and the rationale behind the grouping. <coughs> the category member data sets need to be there and they need to contain all the source data that was used in the read across exercise. And this is essentially what was expected also in Euclid 5, but wasn't always provided. Then moving uh, to the target endpoint study record in the category approach. Here it's important that the type of information field is set to read across based on grouping of substances category approach. The adequacy of study will depend on how the user wants to use this study to fulfill the information requirement. So typically it's then going to be a key study or a weight of evidence. <coughs> then the fields that relate to the experimental setup or the validity or reliability of the source information can be left out in this target record. And then it's very important uh, and as a new thing to add the endpoint specific justification for the read across in the field justification for type of information, as you can see at the bottom of the screenshot. 
<coughs> then moving to the checklist for the analog approach. Here the first thing to do is to make sure that you split the reader cross information into source and target data. The source record, here the type of information, would typically be experimental study and the adequacy of study would be key study usually because to do read across you need a robust study summary level information. The rest of the endpoint study record for the source record would be filled in as any experimental study and it should reflect a standalone study, study summary on the source material so it, it shouldn't be connected to the read across as such. And it's important to ensure when doing this splitting uh, from migrated data that all the information provided in the source record actually reflects uh, the source data. <coughs> then moving to the target record. So here in this Edmoy study record, the type of information should be set to read across from supporting substance, uh, structural analog or surrogate. The adequacy of the study needs again to be set to the appropriate value depending on how the read across is used to fulfill the information requirement. So typically it would be a key study or weight of evidence. Again, the fields uh, that relate to reliability information uh, should be left empty because the reli reliability scoring is related to the experimental study and is provided already in the source data. Again, important to add the endpoint specific justification in the field justification for type of information. And there are actually free text templates available in this field, which help the user in identifying what information should be included in this justification. Finally, in the administrative data part, under cross-reference, there must be a link to the endpoint study record which contains the source data for this read across target. <coughs> Oops. Um, and then moving to the other parts of the uh, read across uh, target record. As I said before, here, fields that relate to the experimental setup of the source study should be left empty because these are already provided in the source uh, record. So as you see in the screenshot, there's no test guideline, uh, GLP compliance indicated or type of method because these are experimental details that are provided in the source record. It's very important to identify here the read across target material in the field test material information and <coughs> to fill in under results, the results for the read across target material. Under the applicant summary and conclusion, you can indicate, uh, depending on the endpoint, uh, if applicable, how these uh, estimated effects for the read across target uh, relate to uh, classification and labeling criteria, or GHS, and, for example, how the results would impact the distribution of the target material in the human body and the environment, depending, again, on the endpoint addressed. And then, uh, under the executive summary, you can briefly uh, summarize the read across, read across approach and the applicability of the results uh, obtained, even if this is an optional section. <coughs> it's important to keep in mind uh, that in the analog approach, source and target records are not by default identical. So uh, here's a table to, to compare a bit um, what data is to be filled in. Uh, you can see that the endpoint would usually be expected to be the same, whereas in the field type of information, we have on the other hand, on the one hand, the source record, which is an experimental study, and the target record, which is the read across <coughs> study. Adequacy of information of the source record is typically expected to be a key study level, whereas the target record could be key study or weight of evidence uh, if used to fulfill information requirements. Reliability needs to pro be provided for the source record, uh, and the rationale for reliability is recommended, but not for the target record whereas the justification for type of information is mandatory for the target record. <coughs> also, a cross-reference from the target record to the source record should be provided inside the target record. Then, uh, the fields that relate to experimental uh, information um, and the source of this uh, data, so data source and materials and methods, are mandatory for the source record, but not the target record. The exception is test materials, which needs to be provided in both. In the source record, this reflects the tested material of the experimental study, whereas in the target record, it's the read across target material. Now, this may refer to the main constituent of the registered substance, but potentially in a more complex substance, it could be uh, a component of the entire substance. Uh, but this needs to be clearly, clearly defined in the target record. Uh, then results and discussion 
for the source record, the experimental result needs to be uh, defined as usual. Whereas for the target record, uh, this needs to be the target uh, material result after applying the read across and include this, should, this result should include any corrections made on the result of the source material, for example, uh, for differences in molecular weight between the two substances. And then at the applicants in the applicant summary and conclusion, again, since in this, uh, in this chapter, uh, there are comparisons to GHS criteria and implications of the results for the distribution of the substance. Uh, this will differ between the source and target records. And also the executive summary will be for the experimental study in the source record, where it uh, whereas it will uh, summarize uh, the read across approach in the target record. So it's good to keep in mind that these are not uh, identical records and they should uh, contain different data as presented here. <coughs> then moving to the third part, uh, the amendment of REACH annexes 7 and 8. So what are these amendments about? Um, there are amendments to the information requirements on skin corrosion and irritation and serious eye damage, eye irritation. And these amendments entered into force or into effect on June 21st this year. And this amendment makes the in vitro studies the standard information requirement at annexes 7 and 8. And in vivo studies should only be considered if in vitro studies are not applicable or the results are not adequate for classification and risk assessment. Then there's an amendment to the skin sensitization requirement. And this has been approved um, and it's prepared for publication in the official journal in the coming month or close by. And this amendment again makes the in vitro or in chemical studies the standard information requirement at Annex 7. Again, in vivo should be considered only if the in vitro in chemical uh, test methods are not applicable or the results are not sufficient for classification and risk assessment. What are the consequences of these amendments for reporting information in Euclid? It means that to be complete, registration dossiers with Annex 7 requirements and above must contain at least one endpoint study record addressing the in vitro, or in the case of skin sensitization, in chemical requirement. And such endpoint study records must be, as usual, key study, weight of evidence, or data weaving to be considered to address the information requirement. And here you see a series of screenshots of examples of how uh, the in vitro uh, information requirement could be addressed in these three sections. <coughs> now, what is the consequence in those cases where the registrant already has an in vivo study available that was carried out or initiated before the Annex Amendment took effect? In this case, the in vivo study and the results from it should be reported as an endpoint study record with the appropriate adequacy of study and the endpoint selection in vivo. Now, in addition to this endpoint study record, there should be another endpoint study record in the same section with the endpoint selection corresponding to in vitro or in chemical in the case of skin sensitization. And it should be indicated as a data waving with the rational study scientifically not necessary, other information available, and with the following justification for data waving, pick list selections. So for uh, section uh, 731, uh, skin uh, irritation corrosion, uh, this uh, pick list selection uh, should be an in vitro skin irritation study, does not need to be uh, conducted because adequate data from an in vivo skin irritation study are available. And there's a corresponding phrase for the eye irritation endpoint. So far, we don't have uh, a phrase like this for the skin sensitization section. So in this section, the user needs to select other in the pick list and add the free text. An in vitro or in chemical skin sensitization study does not need to be conducted because adequate data from an in vivo skin sensitization study are available. And here's an example of a case where the registrant would uh, <coughs> have an existing in vivo study. Uh, so at the top, screen, top right uh, screenshot, you see an in vivo key study, experimental study for skin irritation. And in addition to this, because of the amendments, there now needs to be a second endpoint study record indicated as a, as a data waiver addressing the skin uh, irritation or corrosion in vitro uh, endpoint and with the justification and data waving rationale that were explained in the previous screen. Uh, it's also useful to keep in mind that when doing this kind of data waving uh, based on information, uh, available information in the data set, it's useful to use the cross-reference table 
a bit lower down in the administrative data part uh, to create a link from the data waving record to the record which has the information uh, on which basis the, the data waving is created. So in this case, is, uh, in this case uh, the data waving record for the in vitro uh, would have a link uh, or a cross-reference to the in vivo endpoint study record to make it clear to the reader where the information used as a basis for waving is available. Okay, that was all for me. I hand over to Francois for the Q&A. Thank you very much for sending all these questions to us. We are trying to answer them uh, also online. And as I said, uh, we will prepare uh, and finalize the answers in a written document that will be, will be published on the, on the Euclid website. I will now uh, take some questions that are, have been uh, frequently asked by uh, the participants to this webinar. The first one uh, was about, about the synchronization between Euclid and Kesar. So uh, maybe uh, not everybody knows that uh, Kesar and Euclid are able to communicate. And this is mainly uh, for Kesar 3 to import substance properties in order to perform the exposure assessment. And Kesar is also able to send back the use uh, uses described in uh, defined in Kesar to section 3.5 of Euclid. So there is a, a plugin in Euclid that establishes the connection between these two tools. And as I mentioned, we are we are planning to upgrade Kesar in October, and the Euclid 6 release at the end of September will already um, um, include some improvements that will be compatible only with the next version of Kesar. So that's why we advised our Kesar users to wait for the upgrade of Euclid and uh, to do uh, the update of both tools, KSR3 and Euclid 6, when KSR3 uh, update is available in October. In the future, um, we will uh, try to synchronize a bit more the releases of these tools, uh, particularly in the October release. So in October 2017, um, there might be some compatibility differences or changes that will affect these two tools, and we will always uh, release Euclid before and we'll try to uh, have a Kesar update two weeks after the uh, Euclid release. But until that date, until October 2017, um, we will maintain the compatibility of both tools so that uh, the upgrade of these tools can be done independently. There are also some questions on the comparison tool in Euclid 6. So this comparison tool will be available in the September release at the end of the month and it will work as in Euclid 5 on dossiers. So you will be able to select two dossiers and compare their content. There were some questions about the possibility to compare two data sets. So it's not possible, but you can create one dossier for each of the data set and then compare these two, two dossiers to identify similar similarities between the two. Uh, there were some questions on these new features introduced um, in Euclid 6, uh, in this Euclid 6 update at the end of the month, and Mark highlighted some of the, the key uh, features that have been added. Uh, we invite you also to have a look at the updated help system um, in Euclid 6 and the updated Euclid 6 functionalities manual that will be, will be updated at the end of the month together with the release. And there you will find more information on how these new functionalities are uh, can be uh, used. <coughs> there were also questions on the TCC, the technical completeness check, and the differences between Euclid and Rich IT. So as um, for Euclid 5 and Rich IT 2, with the, the update of the tool, Euclid 6 and Rich IT 3, we have uh, a one-to-one -one, um, matching between the completeness check that is performed in Euclid 6 and Rich IT. What we have introduced with these new tools is also a manual verification that is done at ECA uh, during submission. And if you want to learn more about uh, what are these manual verific verification performed on your dossiers after submission, uh, you can go on the ECA website uh, and under support manuals, you will have more information on this manual verification. Then there was a question also on the availability of a Euclid webinar for beginners. And uh, I would invite you to follow the webinar that we plan in as part of the Roadmap 2018 uh, communication plan. 
we are planning a webinar on the 4th of October, um, which will be on how to prepare and create a registration dossier using Euclid 6 and using Rich IT3. So you can find more information also on the ECA website under support webinars. And you can already register for this webinar on the 4th of October. <coughs> so you can continue to send us uh, more questions. Uh, we will try to answer them uh, still uh, online. And in any case, uh, these questions will be answered in the written document we will publish on, on the Euclid 6 website. We plan to have uh, the recording available in uh, in uh, one week or in a few days uh, on the ECA website and the Euclid 6 website. Thanks a lot for your participation. Uh, we will close the webinar at 12.15 uh, Helsinki time, so you can still send questions. And uh, thanks a lot for your participation. Bye-bye.